now for our special guest today, Joe Devine, the most, what, Joe, Joe in addition to, I'm just gonna say a word and then we're gonna hear a little bit about Joe from Joe. Uh, we've got a really cool, fun video. And uh, Joe is really one of the most futuristic, opportunistic, uh, and uh, visionary people that has, have been part of sort of what, what we like to think of as the expansion of the footprint of, Gen of Jefferson. Having Joe's organization, because you know, there's any place we, there are many places Jefferson could have gone in New Jersey to expand the footprint, but the decision to bring in a guy with high emotional intelligence, deep background, and tremendous capacity is really a statement about Joe and about what he's built in, in New Jersey. So, um, so he, he'll be talking about how, it's be how we are better together, but let me, let me just roll to the, uh, to the video. My name is Joe Devine. I'm the Executive Vice President of Hospital and Health Services for Jefferson Health, and I'm the President of Jefferson Health of New Jersey. The topic that we chose is because, you know, one of the reasons that we decided to merge Kennedy into Jefferson was the opportunity to advance our organization in the area of innovation. Now, innovation to me is a variety of things. The one important component is everybody thinks right away that innovation is only technology. It's not. It's about how you operate, what you do, and what you're offering different that the consumer is going to choose. So from our perspective, merging with Jefferson and being together with Jefferson is allowing us to do things like telemedicine, is allowing us to do more advanced programs in New Jersey, which to me is innovative for the community. And ultimately it's for us to come and tell them how from a community-based standpoint, that's how we've been successful over the years to grow an organization. So from an innovation standpoint, it also ties into the culture, who you are as an organization. The one thing I'm most proud of that we had at Kennedy for years was we were a top workplace for many years. And I believe what makes organizations successful from an innovative standpoint is the people who work for them. So if you have an engaged workforce, that allows you to do all types of innovative things because people are thinking out of the box. And to me, innovation is figuring out what the next generation should be, how we should start thinking about doing things differently. In the world of healthcare, we historically have always done things the way we thought that they should be done because they were done like that for years. But our opportunity is the consumer base is changing. People are looking for new ideas. They're looking to do things that have immediate response. And that immediate response, believe it or not, doesn't necessarily just mean technology. It means how do they get the answers to the questions they're looking for? How do they get the diagnosis they need? And it's our responsibility in healthcare to try to be creative and innovative to allow people not only interact with us, but for us to make it easier for them to communicate, to contact us, and to work with us. Because we want everyone to be part of our organization, whether it be the students who are part of the university, or the patients who use us, or the employees who work for us. There is a whole generation of people who look at things differently. So for me, an innovative standpoint is, how do you take what's happened in the past, look to the future, and bridge the communication gap that may occur between different generational groups, but continue to get the same message out and continue to deliver outstanding things and services for the consumers who use us. So that's how I look at innovation. I actually said that. <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks for having me as always. Thank you, thank you. It's always great to be out here at Jefferson. It's great to have some of the deans here. Thank you for being here. And it's great to have many of the students here. So I will uh, start by saying I love innovation and technology because last Friday I became a grandfather for the very first time with a grandson. So, and why I tell you the story is I get my everyday fix with a couple pictures sent to me, which now I understand I can do on this cloud, which I'm learning that I can go out and see his picture whatever I want. So that's great news. So innovation and technology certainly is something important. So let me, let me tell you a little bit of history of, and I think it's important to set the foundation and the stage of why I'm speaking and why I'm proud to speak here, but most importantly, how we got to become part of this organization and why we chose to become part of this great institution. Many years ago, I actually worked at Pennsylvania Hospital at Athens Spruce. Matter of fact, I worked for a gentleman there named Mr. Cathcart. They actually have a building named after him there. Mr. Cathcart was a legendary CEO who ran the hospital for 43 years. He literally lived on the campus. On the campus he lived. And every Thursday night, and for those of you who are in medicine can appreciate this, every Thursday night, 
Mr. Cathcart would require his young re administrators to go on rounds with him. We had to meet him at 6.30. We had to go on rounds with him and we'd go throughout the building and believe me, when we first started, we were petrified. But he taught me three fundamentally important things. Number one is make sure you never lose the foundation of why you're here. So when we go on rounds, we're gonna visit patients because that's why we're here to take care of patients. Number two is make sure you know all your physicians who work for you because the medical staff is equally important as a consumer to you as patients. And number three is get to know every one of your employees by first name. Now, I within reason have successfully done that as my staff at Kennedy could tell you. However, when we joined Jefferson and now there's 35,000 of the people, I might just say oh, only able to know some faces. But the reality of it is I believe that what makes organization successful and what makes innovation something that's imperative to organizations are the people. Innovation and ideas don't come from out of some groundswell. They come from the people within the organization who have the ability to make a difference. And over the years, I have seen that happen in my organization. Now, I lasted at Ken I've been at Kennedy for 32 years. I started when I was 12. And, okay, I didn't start when I was 12. But the reality of it is I started and grew up through the ranks there. And when I went from Pennsylvania Hospital to Kennedy in South Jersey, it was a small osteopathic hospital that no one thought would really survive for 20 years. And I thought that I would stay for three years and somehow I'd end up back in Philadelphia. Well, 32 years later, I finally got back. But the reality of it was is that I saw the future as being something that needed to be happened differently in New Jersey that the great, the people from Philadelphia were, tr were moving to New Jersey and they required and wanted top quality healthcare in South Jersey. We had a lot of things that we needed to do. And one of the things that I thought was important was to build the organization based on the premise of how we could deliver the services for the consumers we want. And that's what innovation is about. So let me talk to you a little bit about how we got there, where we've been. And by the way, I always say this importantly, and this is not disrespectful to Jefferson, anybody at Jefferson. We did not need to merge. We did not. Four years ago, I made $50 million as an organization. Jefferson hasn't made $50 million in years, okay? We made $46 million three years ago. And the last two years, we made in the 30s. Economically, we did not need to merge. Neither did we need to merge from a clinical standpoint. We had outstanding clinical programs that continued to grow. And as you know, we were a top workplace, which I was proud of. But we merged because what was most important was the future. It wasn't about what today is, it was about the future. And when I became the CEO six years ago after having grown up in the organization, the hardest challenge that I needed to realize was that I needed to think about the future, not the day. Because when you're an operator, your job is to just fix things. My job was to think for the future. And thinking for the future has to reflect on what you want the future for your community, and that's what we tried to accomplish. So as you can see, we did make the trek across the bridge. And uh, although um, it was important for us because between 2012 and 2017, healthcare had a lot of changes going on. The healthcare landscape was dramatically changing at that point in time since the Affordable Care Act was passed. But it was also changing because the consumers wanted a different healthcare community for themselves. So we knew that was important. We knew that we were changing our organization. We needed to change the organization to think differently. There were many people who were executives in the organization, and even physician leaders who thought in the old way of providing care and servicing consumers. It was no longer about them. It was really gonna be about the consumers and what consumers expected from the community from a healthcare standpoint. In addition, we needed to elevate our quality, which we did. And I'll talk to you about a few of those stories shortly. We needed to create financial resilience. Although we were always a viable organization, I will tell you from when I told you that number of $50 million, only two years before we made two million and we used to celebrate two million but we needed to create an engine that would drive our organization because it's all about investing. As a not-for-profit, which healthcare institutions majority are, we still have to invest in organizations for our community. So in order to make the, the, the commitments we make, whether it be in technology, facilities, or in staffing, we have to be able to make those investments keep continue to grow. The other thing that was important was we needed to, to strengthen our market brand. In New Jersey, we were kind of the third tier brand behind two other big providers. We knew we wanted to continue to grow and strengthen that. Next is, we needed, I knew that we needed to create a new culture. You will see, and I believe, and I've talked to these people at Jefferson about this all the time, what makes great organizations is the culture. If you don't have the right culture, you're never gonna be successful. It doesn't matter how your outcomes are, it only matters how your culture is. Because your culture helps us deliver innovation, 
patient experience, great student experiences, great academic experiences and research. It's all about how we treat one another. And that's ultimately what makes organizations successful. So as I always say, the secret of change is to focus on all your energies, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. I will tell you here, here, we fight the old. We still want to keep the old. It's hard. It's hard to make change. And I give the people here tremendous respect because what's happened is you have all of us new people who've come to the table who have new ideas, and we're not being res res disrespectful of the Jefferson history, but we know there's a different dynamic moving forward. So we have to balance respecting the old and pushing towards the new. So to me, all these things are about new and where we need to go. So let me tell you where we were so really quickly so you can see where we're going. This was, although it's not moving, I'm not moving. There we go. Moved a couple things. This was our campuses, by the way. We were once an osteopathic hospital of one building in Stratford, New Jersey in 1965. And those of you who are in MD programs or MDs, you'll know that osteopathic medicine was considered second tier by some, some lower. And when they built this hospital in Stratford, it was really a commitment to build for the community. And candidly, in Camden County, the MDs did not want the osteopathic hospital open. And I'll tell you a legendary story, which is quick, only for your information. It's kind of irrelevant only to me. You know how life puts you in weird places? I was actually, when I was hired to work at Kennedy by the CEO at the time, he asked me if I had any relatives that worked at Stratford or knew people at Stratford. I said, no, I, I don't. I said, but I'll ask my mother because I know she has relatives in New Jersey. So I asked my mother, and she says, oh, yeah, my cousin had something to do with politics in South Jersey. He was pretty powerful, but I knew he had something to do with a hospital. So I went back and told the CEO that next Monday that my, who my cousin was, and he stopped in his feet and he said, let me just tell you something. We would not be here as Kennedy if your cousin hadn't helped us get this facility. So the irony is I guess I was meant to be there, and hopefully that's why I was meant to be. Maybe there's a tie-in to Thomas Jefferson to me. I have no idea. But anyhow, we have three campuses real quick, Stratford, Washington Township, Cherry Hill. This is how they looked in the, in the current days, in the old days. We had a pluralistic medical staff model. Basically, most of our physicians for many years were just private. We didn't own any physicians. Here at Jefferson, you have a large academic base. We had none of that to 2012. Every one of our physicians were private, operating in the private world, and it was very difficult to get private physicians to think differently because you weren't paying them. They were actually your customers, but at the same time, they were growing the market. We also had a partnership and still do with the UMDMJ School of Osteopathic Medicine, now called the Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine. So they had been our partner since 1977. We share a campus with them in our Stratford facility on the Stratford community. We also had limited, we had two employed physicians, both interventional radiologists. No one else was employed. And in November of 2012, we decided to hire our first, I'm sorry, 2010, our first primary care physician, first ever. And the only reason we hired him is because we knew he lived in West Stafford and we wanted to put an office there. And in overnight, the practice took off because we realized that we should start creating our own physicians to think, we were thinking out of the box because in healthcare in New Jersey, you didn't really employ physicians in the private market, especially if you were a suburban base. So we did that. And we continue to have a very, in the osteopathic world, strong, strong primary care loyalty was important. And that continued to happen. We certainly had a lot of gaps. We didn't have a lot of the high level clinical services that they had here at Jefferson. So we knew, we knew we needed to kind of fill some of those in, which we did. We knew when we looked at our market, the greatest growth, and if you know anything about South Jersey, is south in Gloucester County and north actually in Burlington County. So we were starting to really strategize of how we grow those markets as well. And our Cherry Hill market, I was embarrassed to say that we only own 8% of the market. Now, at one time, that hospital was run and owned by a group of osteopathic physicians who were loyal to one another. And when I first got there, Cherry Hill was the busiest surgical facility in South Jersey because the osteopathic physicians supported the physicians who were on that. And I tell the story, which is true. The reason they opened that hospital there, because it was an osteopathic physician in Philadelphia, whose primary care doctor started to move, move to Cherry Hill. He went out one Sunday afternoon before C engine requirement in 1960, found a parcel of land on a farm and built a hospital. And I was embarrassed to say 8% because the most influential communities in South Jersey are Haddonfield, Morristown, and Cherry Hill 
We're in Cherry Hill, and you can throw a stone to the other two. So we needed to really look at what our future was going to be. And that was most important. And most importantly for me, I needed to create a strong physician leadership model. My predecessors, as much as I respect them, didn't really value how important it was to have physician leaders to help drive an organization. To me, they're the people who could think thoughts about not only patients, but how to be innovative in taking care of patients. And for me, that was going to be a differentiator. A little bit about our employee engagement, and I put this out only because it was 2012. Yes, I was there, but I was not the CEO until the beginning of 2013, okay? In 2012, basically the physician survey said there's no culture of accountability here. No one does anything. And the medical staff has no meaningful role. Well, you can't function if you're not gonna do great things with great people. So here's how we got to where we got to to become part of Jefferson. And why this is important is because if you think about the start of a small osteopathic hospital in Stratford, to evolve itself into an osteopathic institution that ultimately becomes the partner of a world-renowned institution in Philadelphia is not an easy journey. It's a journey where you have to build. And starting in 2012, at the end when I took over, we started to build our organization on a couple things. Top priority for everyone was patient safety and quality. Everyone. That meant me. That meant the housekeepers. That meant the security people. Everyone was responsible for patient safety and quality. Because you know what? Because what we do in healthcare, no matter how innovative and creative we are, if patient safety is not our top priority, we don't do anything. We shouldn't do anything because that's got to be our focus. Number two is we need to realize what our plan was going to be for the future. Because my goal, by the way, always was in my mind, it may sound joking to you and at this point in time, but when I became the CEO, I always thought that we needed to be a partner with a Philadelphia institution because I thought that would actually create a difference for the community. And that's what it was all about. And we basically also knew is realistic plans are important, innovation's important, but if you don't execute, you don't have anything. Because execution is what makes the difference in great institutions, and by the way, great organizations across the country. You have to execute, right? So you could have a great plan, but if you don't execute the plan, you're not gonna be successful. So we knew along the way that was important. And the result in the future state was something we thought about as well. So let me show you this real quickly. I developed our, our planning criteria on a pyramid. My thought was always you needed to have the foundation to be able to go up. So our first foundation, level five, was about us really thinking about our, our future plans, then our physician alignment, then our financial facilities investments, because we needed to improve our place. Because guess what? If we weren't proven and want to be a partner with Jefferson, and they looked at our facilities and said, ah, you guys, we're not really interested. We needed to make sure we were making a commitment for the community and for our partner. Then, by the way, I will talk about this briefly. You have a tremendous school of population health. Okay. And Dr. Nash would be the first to admit this. You have a school of population health. You don't do population health here clinically. Very little. We do substantial population health. Because in our market, we had no choice. We were required to think differently out of the box quickly. And now a lot of the programs that we have in place, our team is working with the team at Jefferson to help collate them and make them successful across the enterprise. And then finally, after we did all these things, five, four, three, two, one, we knew we were ready for a partner. Now, we could have chosen Penn. We could have chosen Cooper. We could have chosen other hospital systems throughout the market. My vision was that it always had to be someone who was going to be fundamentally surrounded by our core mission. And what this circle means important to you is it's all about people. Some organizations think it's about financial and market targets, they all come. If you have people engagement, you have the right patient experience and the right safety and quality, you'll be successful. We proved it. We proved that you could do this. And I think when you look at this core mission, if you stay focused, no matter what our thought process is for the future, our core mission is what we do. And just like here at Jefferson, we're here to improve lives. Our lives are, are not only patients, but it's the students, it's the people we do research for, and it's each other. And to me, that's what's fundamentally driven success of any organization. This is just a hybrid thing, which I'll go over quickly, which I'll pass over. But our key imperatives are always the following. Organizations are successful on transparency. There can be no secrets. Okay? And by the way, when there's no secrets, it can be difficult conversations have to occur. Okay? One of the things that I required every single leader in the organization to go through, which started with me, was to, was to be educated on servant leadership. Now, I'm a graduate from St. Joe's University, and we actually picked them to be our partner. Most people think I picked them because I was a graduate. 
I picked them because they had just completed a program with Wawa. Now, I happen to know the CEO at Wawa. So at the time, I said, you know, let me call Chris and ask him what this program's really about. So I went and spent three trips to Wawa at their main headquarters. And I learned what they really were trying to do in the servant leadership. And somebody said, well, why would you as a healthcare institution try to copy the Wawa model? I wasn't. I was trying to think about how do you infuse the, the importance of culture and service into a healthcare institution, okay? But I knew fundamentally we needed to create something different with the leaders. Because if you don't have the leaders who are committed to it, why would your staff be committed to it? So all 500 leaders in our system over a three year period went through servant leadership training, which wasn't one time, it was like a course over a 16 month period. And when I left Wawa at my, my second to last visit, Chris said to me, when you go into our stores, go visit 10 of our stores in the next two weeks. Come back to me and tell me what you hear. I came back and told them what I heard. I heard the same language, the same philosophy and treatment to their customers, but most importantly, the same treatment to each other. Whether somebody was a leader, was a, was a new trainee, et cetera, that's what made the difference. So I wanted to adopt a model that put in place that would make this successful. One of the things that attracted Steve Klasko to us was that model, was the fact that he felt that there's no culture that he ever came in contact with, which I'm proud to say, that really had that, how they operate as an organization. So it talked about narrowing our focus, cohesiveness, really being servant leaders and driving an organization. And again, that started with me. I actually hired a coach when I became the CEO. I hired a coach and my, one of my team members says, why do you need a coach? You're one of the most polished professionals I know. I said, because I needed to think differently than I did when I was doing something else. And I hired a PhD psychologist. When I selected her, people said, she is so different than you. Why did you pick her? You could have picked four other former CEOs. I said, you know, they got a lot of hot air. I said, they weren't gonna help me at all. I said, I needed someone who was really gonna make me think differently. And she did. She made me think differently. And the irony is she happens to be one of our coaches for our JOLT program here at Jefferson. And she made me think differently because she made me think out of the box, which may not be all technology innovation, but how I was gonna get what I thought in my mind into reality. And sometimes people who are in your industry or your closest colleagues, they can't be objective with you. But someone who really is different than you can be objective. And I think that's a powerful lesson for all of us. So we adopted and we needed to move on. I believe that an organizational strategy describes how it competes, right? But a culture describes how it behaves, okay? Anybody can be competitive, but they can't behave right. And that's our push. This I won't go over, but I want to show you only some of the metrics that are out here real quickly. This is our current employee survey scorecard. This is the national, in the gray is the national average for hospitals. In the blue is ours, okay? And it talks about people believing that you're going in the right direction. I would venture to guess if we took this survey today at Jefferson, in some areas we would be low the gray. And that's not, that's just reality because it takes time. It's a big institution and we have all these parts coming together and people are anxious when that happens. But I think you'll see is, you know, when people feel informed and engaged, they'll make the difference. And pretty soon I'm gonna show you some things that they've done that have made a difference from a thought process. Five times winner of employee choice. And by the way, this is not bought. We didn't buy it. We didn't put it, we didn't say we wanna participate in a survey ourselves. This was a survey of our employees. This past year, 72% of them responded to an anonymous survey that's done throughout the country. Okay, so we were awarded the fifth time in a row as a top workplace by, in the Philadelphia region. By the way, the only hospital on the list for five years in a row, okay? Now, why is that important to you? Because it's important to us because we always challenge the norm. That's what innovation is about, challenging the norm, right? We challenge the norm. As Dr. Ritz would tell you, when I'm in a meeting, I'm pretty vocal. I'm not disrespectfully vocal, but we have to think differently. And, Sometimes what you do here, I've never been able to think about, but it helps our organization become better as well. So that's what's made us very proud. As you can see, if you have a great culture, the first thing people respond to about is family. Everybody here is from a family, right? Does any of us have perfect families? If we do, please let us know, because we want to mimic that, okay? But the reality of it is, as you can see, family, caring, and the words innovation are all tied together with teamwork. That's how you get the best results, no matter what it is we're gonna do. So family to me is what 
I now consider this to me as the Jefferson family. I refer to it all the time as we're Jefferson strong and we're going to be strong together much better than we are individually. And this is a thing that I'm very proud of. So this is, I guess you would call an innovation project. In 2012, we realized that almost 18% of the patients who were in our hospital or came to our hospital who were identified as having sepsis died. So we had almost an 18% mortality rate. And one of the things we talked about, we talked about improving safety and quality is how do we do a better job of making people who have sepsis who are here, or most importantly, arrive in sepsis, that we give them a chance to survive? What happened was, me being a suit, as some of the docs call me, I turned it over to the clinical team and said, listen, here's my objective. I want us to be the best in the nation when it comes to sepsis survival. The best in the nation. They first looked at me and said, that's kind of like an impossible task. I said, no, it's not. Because with the great clinical leadership have and with the big buy-in of our people, we'll be able to do it. In 2016, we were awarded the National Sepsis Hero Award for our ability to change the outcome of sepsis for all these patients. The irony is in 2017, if you come to our organization in New Jersey and you arrive with sepsis, you have, an, a, a, over, you have only a 9% chance of dying from it. You have a 91% chance of survival. That was done in a variety of ways. Technology, people, processes, and people looking at clinically the right things as a patient arrives. So to me, this is an innovation project that back in its day could have been done differently maybe, but it was done with the thought process of people and we still use technology to help make, it, make the outcomes great. So if you think about it, we've saved people's lives. And as the CMO at Cooper told me when we got this recognition, he says, listen, I saw the billboard. He says, we're always competitive. We are. He says, but when you see a billboard that advertises how you save people's lives, that's all really matters. And I think he's right. So LeapFrog we'll talk about. You all, I assume, know what LeapFrog scores are. We've always been an A grade, and Dr. Clasco is very proud of all of us at, at Jefferson moving towards an A grade. And some, you know, we were B, but we continue to move up. And our Stratford campus is actually a top teaching hospital in the nation for LeapFrog scores. As this continues to go slowly, I got it. We're also what they call in New Jersey a highly reliable organization. There are only 10 hospitals in the state that have been designated to participate in development of high reliable organizations in New Jersey. Now for us, high reliability talks about all the things I spoke about. But most importantly, it talks about that when people come to us, they could feel very confident that the right things are happening for them. And we put all these initiatives in place to make sure they work. But to be one of 10 is a pretty nice recognition. And as an organization now as Jefferson, we're starting to move that forward at our other locations as well to move, to move it forward to the next step. So here's what we did. Not many people have seen this, but you've seen it. This was actually our ranking of our board when we chose Jefferson. Okay? I did not do an RFP, a, re a request for proposal process. I didn't need to because, again, I wasn't desperate to sell. I was looking for a partner, right? I was looking for a partner. And as you can see, Jefferson has the most filled in boxes. And candidly, one of the advantages that Jefferson had was not only my thought process about Jefferson, but was also our relationship already with Dr. Rosenwasser in the neurosciences department and our relationship with the Rothman Institute. And I humbly tell this story because this is true and Mike West tells it all the time for the Rothman Institute. I met him six years in a row and begged him to come work at Kennedy. Begged him. And he says, nah, our docs won't want to work there. We'll probably work in virtual. I says, do me a favor. Just try it. If you try it and don't like it, then you can go somewhere else. Well, almost eight years later, they're the highest volume out procedures they do on any other hospital besides Center City is at Kennedy, is in South Jersey. So, you know, and Dr. Rosenwasser, we were a comprehensive stroke center with him and his team. So Jefferson had an advantage. But as you can see, the Penn model is different. You know, Dr. Clasco has come up with a creative idea of what he classifies as the hub and hub model. Now, we had no idea what the heck that meant when he talked to us. Oh, you want to be part of my hub and hub model? Now, if you know Dr. Clasco, <laughs> matter of fact, I'm going to bid on that car ride with him because, first of all, I want to bid on the car ride so I can take, like, a water ice and spill all over his car because <laughs> I know how important his cars are to him. But, um, but he came to me and said, would you like to be part of a hub and hub? And, of course, my first reaction is, what the heck is a hub and a hub? 
He says, well, I'll explain it to you. But what it does is it brings the healthcare to the community, right? And allows us to do the creativity and the energy arm of Jefferson to do the things we need to do in our community. So that far outweighed anyone else and what they can provide. That's how we chose Jefferson. Because again, we didn't need to choose anybody. But the future was what we were choosing. So let me tell you a little bit about New Jersey for those of you who don't know New Jersey, because it's a great people's republic of New Jersey that operates a lot differently than Pennsylvania. Uh, but basically, right now, there's only 18% of the acute care hospitals are standalone. Everybody is part of the system. Up north, Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas, and Hackensack Meridian basically dominate the market. They each have 13 and 12 hospitals apiece. In South Jersey, it was basically us, Cooper, and Spirit, Virtua, and Lords. And basically, at the end of the day, there won't be many. There will probably be us, who's Jefferson, New Jersey, more than likely Cooper, and of course, Virtua. I believe everybody else will inculcate into something else in the near future. Um, this is a little bit about our targeted map, so you can see it. Our, we, we control, as you, as Jefferson, we control eight regions in South Jersey, are part of our market we consider. There are basically 2.4 million residents in that territory. Um, so it's a pretty big population to serve. This I won't get into a, little, a lot of details, but let me just tell you, you may not know, at Jefferson, New Jersey, you, we do 146,000 emergency department visits. 146,000. So you can imagine the encounters we get through those emergency departments. You do a lot here in Center City, but not even close to that number. But it's a pretty big number for the system. Uh, this is a little bit about our Cherry Hill market. As you can see, some of the competition arise around there. It's a lot more competitive. The mayor of Cherry Hill calls Cherry Hill the mecca of healthcare in New Jersey. He's probably right, because every health system in New Jersey has a facility there. The only good thing is there's only one hospital. It's Jefferson Cherry Hill. So and we're in the process. I'll show you shortly what we've done there. This is our Stratford market, which is basically informational for you, but I'll tell you what our Stratford market is. It was once a very uh, working class blue collar community that supported the hospital. The community has changed. We have some challenging areas not far from our Stratford campus, very similar to an inner city. Matter of fact, I believe that one community is the second highest uh, encounters for drug interaction in the, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, because it's very easy to get the carter up and down where it is to drop off the drugs and move forward. So we see a lot of challenging issues at our Stratford Hospital. Our Stratford campus, ED, is like an inner city hospital on the weekends. So it is a very challenged community, but it's a great community because it serves a strong foundation of people. In addition, here's our Washington Township campus, which is our biggest campus, which everybody, there were two migrations in this country. One migration was to the west, the other was from Philadelphia to Washington Township. So people who move from Philadelphia all move to Washington Township. So they, they expect top level health care in Washington, in New Jersey. A little bit about the market share, which may or may not be relevant to you. Um, Virtua is the dominant player in that market. Uh, believe it or not, in 1998, we almost merged. It was going to be Virtua, Kennedy, West Jersey, and Lords as one hospital. And then we pulled out at the 11th and a half hour and we became our own. But the good news for Jefferson, New Jersey is our market trends on inpatient continues to grow. It's much stronger on outpatients as well. I'll just share with you, you know, a little bit more, some of our net revenue. When you're a $600 million operation, you're a big operation. And that certainly helps drive our operating margins for the system and gives us to invest in ourselves. It's a little bit about stats, which could be relevant. But if you look at it, we're almost, if you add everything up, we're close to 700,000 people to visit us each year. So we have a true commitment. People don't realize that New Jersey has that density of population. And that's something that we know exists as well. This is a little just growth information. We talked about that 50 million, 48, 48 million back in 2014. Well, that helped us catalyst to do the things we needed to do. Um, and of course, any good finance person who has a finance background likes to see that linear chart go up in that direction. So it's always important when you're the CEO that the chart goes in that direction, not in the other direction. Um, next, surgical case volume is big. By the way, as an osteopathic hospital one time, our hospital is mostly medical driven. So now having made the, the, the relationship with Jefferson, we know this number will probably be over 20,000 in the next two years. Because people, 20% of Jefferson's patients lived in South Jersey, in those three counties. Our objective behind the hub and the hub, and the hub and the hub and the hub, is to put those patients in New Jersey. Obviously, high level quaternary stuff will happen here. But the community people wanna be serviced there. ED visits I talked about briefly. And let me talk about our clinical perspective and what we've done. 
We have, that, that number's actually wrong. Remember in 2010, I told you we have one physician? As of the end of March, we have 220 physicians we now employ. Okay. So we originally employed all primary cares, but now we have breast surgeons, thoracic surgeons. Whole, we just hired a GYN oncologist to kind of build our program with Sidney Kimmel to make sure we're available in New Jersey to make this a true comprehensive program for people who live in that community. That is a way to innovatively think about how the, what the community needs and the technology we're putting in place is gonna be very advanced, similar to what you have here, to take care of the people on those campuses. This is our Kennedy Health Alliance practices. Real quickly, I won't go through a lot of detail, but you can see they cover, our primary care physicians cover a lot of territory. So our objective always was just to gain access. So if you have access to patients, then ultimately you're, they're tied into your institution and into your community. And by the way, this is an interesting stat. I'll go back quickly, because this will come up quickly. We, are, we have something called SNFs, specialty physicians who work in long-term care facilities. So we now have 16 facilities where we have doctors or nurse practitioners seeing patients. What does that mean? That means that the patients who always used to have to come to the hospital for readmissions are now being treated in the nursing homes. So as a board, they see these numbers and don't realize 38% of the ambulance visits are declining from what we used to see before. So it's, been, it's a great program that clinically has proved population health right for the elderly population. And that's what we do. And I'll skip over these slides real quickly. This is just some of our primary care visit information. It goes to show you how many patients we've seen. I'll go through that. So let me talk about 192,000 patient encounters in primary care offices. 192,000 encounters of primary care offices basically turns into to a 15% rate of those patients being referred somewhere else for subspecialty care. That's why we build a primary care network. And that's something that we're hoping to help build in this market as well, even in South Philadelphia. Now, I'm a South Philadelphia resident. My mother still lives in South Philadelphia. So for me, Methodist is really my community hospital still. And as I always say, when it comes to Methodist in South Philadelphia, we have to make that a community hospital not a satellite of an academic medical center. Because the people down there, they just, want, they just want clinical care for their community. And one of the things we're gonna do is build upon the primary care base down there. And let me talk about the next item is basically how we build our culture. We talked about that a little bit. I know it's moving a little slow, I'm sorry. So let me talk about these things which are important, which I hope are important to us at Jefferson. Trust, okay? The one thing that can break any organization is the trust of anyone. And I always say this about our physicians with our patients. Just last night, I got a call from a patient, son, who I was pretty upset after the call, who said, you know, my dad was being, he was up in a coronary care unit, and then somebody walked in and said, okay, let me take these devices off you. Somebody else needs this bed more than you. I said, what? He says, yeah, that's what they did. He said, the nurse came in and says, somebody else needs this bed more than you. I says, well, what about the doctor? Did the doctor communicate what was going on? Did the resident communicate? He said, absolutely no one told us what was going on with my father. Now, to say that I was on fire at that point would be an understatement. But the reality of it is, is if you don't keep establish trust with the people you work with, right, and the patients can't establish trust with us, then we don't have anything. So one of the things we build our value on are all these things. Accessibility, trust, accountability, and as leaders and as physicians and as everyone, we need to be accessible to everyone at every time. You know, and, and yeah, it's difficult. But the reality of it is if you're not accessible to the people you're serving or you're not accessible to each other, we're not going to be able to accomplish anything. And that was one of the things that was always important to us is I don't want to lose here is the connectivity we have to the community. Dr. Clasco speaks about thinking globally, acting locally. Just last night I was having a discussion with some of your HR people at the award service in the, at, at the Crystal Team Room. And they were saying, well, that's not thinking one, one Jefferson, Mr. Devine. I said, yes, it is. I says, one Jefferson doesn't mean we do everything exactly alike. Because I will tell you, we have three separate hospitals. We have three separate communities. I never changed the culture of those communities. Did I change the culture mindset? Yes. But I didn't want Cherry Hill people to act like Washington Township people. Because they're servicing different people. They're different types of employees. Just like at Jefferson, we can't have this be the same as it is in New Jersey. And we can't have it to be the same as Abington. We all have to think about how we need to work together to create that unified approach, but let individual cultures exist along the way. A little slow, huh? So our core values we believe in, this is the medical neighborhood, which we put in place years ago to help us with population health management. I didn't stick draw that, but somebody else did. And, and obviously to us, transitions of care were important. This started to look at 
that patients were no longer going to come to the hospital. By the way, it's hard. It's hard as an executive of a hospital to see your patient volumes decline in the hospital because your whole life was about that. It wasn't about taking care of people in the community. It was about the more patients I can get into. The, we used to pray for snowy winters. You know what I mean? And can the flu come back? You know, because it really helped your volumes. But in reality, you have to do the right thing for, what's the, for patients and for the community, and that's what we try to do. So we put a real initiative in place to start talking and managing population health along the way. And this is what we call our DISR program, and it's called a Delivery System Reform Improvement Program in the state of New Jersey. What happened is we decided that we were going to start working with diabetics. When we did the Community Health Needs Assessment that was required by the Affordable Care Act, there were four things that were identified as critical to New Jersey. One was access, and by the way, we did it with all the hospitals in South Jersey. One was access, one was metabolic, well, diabetes, the other was obesity, and the fourth was substance abuse. So we started to think about how do we make inroads on that, because really our responsibility was to do that, so it's to improve care for the community. And that's what we started to look at. And by putting this diabetes program in place, which talks about clinicians who are actually in contact with patients who are diabetics, we reduced our hospital admissions on uncontrolled diabetics by 15%, okay? We reduced 11% short-term admission complications and 23% hospital readmissions for those who were hypertensive who were also diabetics. Now, I will tell you that it doesn't come without a cost. It does, but it's the right thing to do. And the technology we put in place for these people in the community are pretty remarkable. You know, they have ability to monitor their own glucose and send it electronically to us. You know, they have their own heart monitoring systems that we could actually read right off. And our nurses actually navigate the care for them. So this program has proven to be tremendously successful. And if you remember, I talked about the Stratford community. A lot of these people were in that community. And that actually has made a positive impact on them along the way as well. Our keys to success to you. How did we get to come to Jefferson? Our, our primary care growth was something that was important to Greg Jefferson. Our partnership with orthopedics, our health innovations that we had did already, that wasn't as much technology driven, but really patient focus driven. The things that we were going to do with Sidney Kimmel and a cancer program. By the way, Penn was our cancer partner before Sidney Kimmel was. And they weren't a good partner. And I say this publicly because they know I felt that way. They weren't a good partner. They did nothing to help patients in New Jersey. As a matter of fact, patients in New Jersey who lived behind the cancer center were going to Penn for radiation and we're getting radiation treatment, and no one at Penn says, well, wait a minute. Do you know you could drive less than a half a mile to, your, to the hospital around the corner where our doctors are and give you radiation? Well, their whole model was about the mothership. It wasn't about creating community-based care, and I think that's important. We are the largest provider of bariatric surgery, Raj even knows this, in the, in the network and in New Jersey. 650 cases last year, okay? Transforming lives in a remarkable way. I tell this story, and I don't have the picture, but it'll be out shortly in an article. I have a little friend of mine who I went to high school with, who I guess you would say he's kind of connected, if you know what I mean by the word connected. And, and he came to me, he came to our hospital a couple years ago, 545 pounds, wore a 78 jacket. Now, I've known him for years. I've seen him for years. He's been a friend, been a, you know, an acquaintance. And he came in, he ended up being in the ICU, they had a trach on, they had to intubate him. And when he got out of all that, we have a little critical care specialist named Dr. Wiley. He says, you want to go into your friend with me? I says, yeah. She says, listen, I'm not going to treat you anymore. She says, this is the fourth time you're back and you're going to die. He says, you have to make some critical decisions. So Frank called me and says, what could I do? I said, listen, the only option for you is bariatric surgery. I says, but you're not compliant. I don't think you're going to be a good patient. He says, I promise I'm going to be a good patient. So we first sent him through the program. He was not compliant. And they decided not to take him. He once again ended back up in the hospital. And he got sick, and he was sick for a longer period of time. And one day I went to his bedside. Here's the deal. I says, this is your last chance. Bariatric surgery is going to be your savior. On May 1st, he had bariatric surgery at 545 pounds. He just sent me a picture yesterday. He is now 260 pounds. His life has totally changed. And to me, we in healthcare should be proud of that because that's the things we could do to help people's lives. We are an expert in behavioral health services, by the way. We are the biggest behavioral health provider in New Jersey, in our market. We have expertise in opioids, 
we're doing a lot of great things when it comes to that, and we're, we're certainly moving along value-based payments. We always believe that maybe sometimes it's riskier not to take a risk, right? Sometimes all you're guaranteeing is that all things are still the same. We can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that at Jefferson at all. We have to be creative, innovative, thoughtful, and think about the future at everything we do because that's the most important thing we can do. And why are we better together? Here's what we've done so far. We are now using the Alexa app in our ED, where our ED staff could say, Alexa, we need a pickup from the Jefferson you know, Connect to actually transfer a patient. So we're using Alexa, okay, which is pretty cool. We're also using more in-touch robotics that has been part of the Jefferson Innovation. We have more Jeff Connect in New Jersey doing more primary care visits that way as well. And we were the actual winners of the second Jefferson Jazz Tank, right? in a program called uh, My Bed, right, about long-term care, so we're still working on, where a physician can go on and look and say, where is our long-term care placement bed for this patient? So innovation is one of the reasons we joined Jefferson, and it's one of the things we're seeing that's benefiting us now, is the great things we could do. Let me talk about this quickly. There's no bigger issue in this country than behavioral health and substance abuse issues. They are interrelated, okay? We actually started a collaborative in New Jersey with five other hospitals to build innovation and to create a different way to treat patients who come to our hospitals who have behavioral health or substance abuse challenges. I will tell you as an industry, we do a terrible job at that. And it's not that people are not trying, it's just that we have not thought about how to do this differently because these patients have a lot of different needs than we're aware of. So we're gonna start, we've started putting together something that we think is innovative and creative for New Jersey. And we're starting to think about that at Jefferson as well is how we can do that. But I'm gonna show you this as part of this collaborative. This kind of was our community health needs assessment. As you can see, 67% of the people who responded said substance abuse, and 69% said it was, it was basically overweight and obesity, which are all behavior-related activities. So we knew we had to do something different. And when you get five hospital CEOs to agree to do something together, it's kind of a rarity. But my philosophy is always, our greatest competitors are also our greatest collaborators. Because healthcare is not about competing, it's about treating people. And if you treat people together, that's all that matters. So I won't even go who they were, but basically we've accomplished a lot of things, including how we deal with substance abuse withdrawals, how we actually work with that along the way to build better information. We had information from the Camden Coalition. We had 120 patients who had over 7,000 7, ED visits in a two year period. Well, those patients, that should never happen to them. So what we all did is we all invested $100,000 a piece. Now, we don't, even have a, we don't even have a hospital in Camden. But as I always tell people, whatever happens in a city impacts the suburbs. So we gave our $100,000, as the two other hospitals don't have hospitals in the city, and we actually built a homeless shelter, a place where people can go. It's called Housing First. And those visits declined 70% from after that was put in place. Because if you think about it, people have nowhere to go. They're treated, and we put them out in the street, not rightfully so, but they go. They have nowhere to go. And a lot of times, if they're not treated properly, they come back. So our whole goal behind that was to do something that we knew would be different. Opioids are a big issue. We're at the forefront of that. We actually have a physician who's kind of a leader in that, Dr. Jim Baird, who's decided on his own and actually expanded it, that he was getting disgusted in the ER every day, seeing people who kept coming back with these opioid addictions. As part of that, we became the first hospitals, two of us in Gloucester County, in the state of New Jersey to start contributing Narcan back to the police squads. And now in Camden County, we do the same thing because our responsibility is to make sure the squads are changed to help reverse the opioid, the, the, the overdose, but also ultimately to get them in the programs, to get them treated and to get them taken care of along the way. Our keys, of course, educating them, and I won't go it. We have something called the City of Angels in New Jersey that, that's recovery coaches. The, the minute a person is bought in with a Narcan, or an opioid overdiction, they actually are called up and they start partnering with these people to start figuring out how to manage them through the next phase of life so they don't keep coming back and keep occurring. But opioids is a real concern for all of us. And the other concern is our prescribing patterns of physicians. And that was something that Dr. Baird put in place that we saw a 52% decrease in opioid prescriptions at our organization during that period of time. So our transformation continues. This is our new Cherry Hill campus. Many of you have seen it. It is the most modern campus. As a matter of fact, my facilities team just proudly showed me today in the International Magazine of Architects. It was awarded one of the top 20 
architectural designs in the country last year. So when we build a hospital, I always tell the people, I don't care what you do in the back, but I want the front to look community worthy. It's built in Cherry Hill. Cherry Hill is the most affluent community in South Jersey. If you ever get a chance to visit it, it's a unique place to see. So, and of course the Jefferson signs are very prominent. Uh, this is some of the looks at the interior. That's a reality of how it looks like. It's really art deco, very nice. And some of the colors I want to pick, but that's okay. I, I should be picking them anyhow. Um, so this is what it will look like when it's complete. We're actually in the way, phase of building a whole new patient tower, this final building over here on, the left, on your left, which will be done hopefully in the next year and a half. And this is what it will look like at night. And you would say, my board said, why did you put that stairwell? Now, I, I apologize, the old logo is still there. Why did you put that stairwell there? Anybody have an idea? Why I put the stairwell there? It was lit up like that? So one of the things we had for our employees, we have a very robust interactive health wellness initiative. So every year, all our employees go through interactive health evaluations. One of the thoughts that the staff had is, Mr. Devine, we walk the stairways, but the stairways are dark and dingy. Even if a bright light, there's no daylight. So we decided to make a marquee piece and actually put an exterior stairway so that our employees would use it and our medical staff, anybody who wanted to use it didn't have to use an interior stairwell to make it creative so that they felt refreshed throughout the day and revigorated. So now we're gonna be challenged to figure out where to put that in the next one. <laughs> this is our Washington Township campus, which is our biggest campus. Um, a major, these are two major expansions underway, a new patient tower and a parking garage. You would think in New Jersey you don't need parking garages, you do, because people don't wanna work two, two miles away, and that's a challenge we've had. And that's just an aerial view of what you'll see and what you'll be completed in the next couple of years. So it'll be pretty creative. And to me, all advanced technology. We're doing a lot of good things in the patient rooms that are all advanced technology. As a matter of fact, I was talking to our, our uh, partners when it has to. I think, I think Neil and his team are doing a, something with, what is that, Raj, where they're actually putting a, a screen where you can wash your hands for 22 seconds. It's like a message. I said, I'm okay with the message as long as it's from me. And they said, no, 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 please. But it's great. So the technologies we're looking at to make it part of this building. And to finish up, if it ever goes forward, <laughs> is we tie it all into our plan. So if you take two organizations, if you remember our pyramid and what we wanted to do and how we're blending Jefferson and Kennedy is the, basically the following. It's the ambition to excel in excellence and in innovation. Innovation can mean a variety of things, but it really focuses on people. And if innovative technology helps people, that's great. If other innovative ideas help people, that's even just as equally as good. One is to become a large regional provider of primary care, which we will be in New Jersey and we'll control the market in that way. And then really have large scale economies of scale with an institution that we think is great to be our partner. And here's all the clinical service lines at Jefferson that are integral to that. And that's how we got from there to where we are today. So I hope it gave you a little bit of overview of who we are, what we've done, how we became part of Jefferson and how we view innovation and technology and hopefully it answers some of your thoughts and questions. And if not, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome, Thank you Donna. so much. That has to be one of the best and most inspirational boots on the ground presentations I think I've ever heard. <laughs> You're on just too nice to me. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it, it was, you know, you and I talk all the time, yeah. but this was really an education. I, I personally appreciate it. I know there are a lot of people here, too. Any questions? Dean Grunwald. Thanks, Donna. Thank you very much, Joe. Indeed, it Thanks was wonderful. Um, in addition to the outstanding clinical activities and the partnership, could you briefly comment on existing or where we should look for opportunities in the education and or research area? Yes, and that's one of the things we just talked about. Uh, research is obviously key for us in cancer. We don't do much of that and we need to do it. However, I do think there needs to be an educational footprint in New Jersey. I'm not sure what that educational footprint is. I just had some of our facility people out last week to look at some space because I think we need to think about how, don't let this just be healthcare because we made a commitment to New Jersey. The commitment needs to be in the area of research and education. So I know Steve agrees with that. We're just trying to what that is. We've also talked to the city of Camden about doing some kind of innovative hubs there as well. But the reality of it is I think we just need to make sure that the focus continues for New Jersey it's all on education, research, and what we do. It's just not healthcare. So it's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? See, this is how good your presentation was. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Because usually know. there's like a ton of questions, right. but it was just, everything was just front loaded into the presentation. Rose, did, did you, were you doing this? 
Um, we've certainly found it's been awesome working with everybody up in, up in, up in the new facilities that have become part of Jefferson, the Kennedy um, facilities, that there, it, part of the culture is that people think outside of the box and they're mm -hmm. thinking about innovative ideas. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit as you, were, as you were thinking and you envisioned the culture and you got there, what kind of rewards, what was your reward structure for people as they helped participate in innovation projects? Or, you know, how, how did you do Getting stuff? Getting to work with me. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think it was pretty clear. Obviously, you know, we have an incentive system that rewards people. But honestly, you know, financial rewards are one thing. But giving people the recognition to be part of something special is something that's equally important. Like the Sepsis Initiative, no one got any financial rewards out of it. What they got out of it was tremendous pride to actually be recognized as the best in the nation at something. So for us, we've always believed that the teamwork is what the mo is most paramount to anything. The other thing that's important is that there's no question that should go unasked, and there's no challenge that shouldn't be made, as long as it's made respectfully. You know, and I certainly don't have all the answers. I don't want to have all the answers. But having people around who are willing to be and think out of the box we always try to reward in their performance evaluations, but most importantly, we reward them by giving them the recognition to understand that it's, they've really made a difference in the organization. And to me, it's 5,000 people. There could be someone who's working along the, you know, in the front line doing something that every day should be able be, has more creative ideas than any of us who sit in an office building. The one thing I don't like about being the CEO, candidly, is it, it forces me where I have to go out to the, the hospitals. I used to always have an office in the hospitals. So for me, when I got, the, piece, the patients and the employees, as my staff know, are my oxygen. Okay? Whenever I want oxygen, I just go out there. The great news is, is when you're in the building, you can just go out there. Well, now you make time to go out there. But what I always say to the staff is, you're the one who's going to make the difference. Come up with a new idea or an innovative thought process that will create something new for us that will make it better for the patients or better for you. And I think that's what we try to do. So in everybody's performance evaluations, we make sure that's, that's incorporated, depending on the level of what that degree it is, but every executive has the ability and the opportunity to be thinking creatively and should be encouraging creativity amongst their staff as well. So that's how we did it in our culture. Last question, back here. Hi, my name is Brian Tell. I'll be a um, surgery intern here starting in June. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Um, so I, you spoke very um, candidly about sort of the tension in these new pavement models between like um, wanting people to be in the hospital, but also needing to have these population-based approaches. One of my friends who wrote a book about healthcare and new payment models, one of the things she says is when you take this to the maximum, the CEO of a hospital really starts to look like a mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, when you look 10 or 15 years down the line, in terms of population health, what do you think you or your successor role is gonna be, and what does a su successful network look like in terms of how it's engaging you know, beyond just building homeless shelters? Good question. And homeless shelter is one idea that was just shared collaboratively through a community. But I think, I think the community looks as a mass of a population. How do we measure the outcomes of the population is what we're going to look at. Our responsibility is going to be what are those outcomes. The one thing that I never want people to lose sight of, we're still going to need hospitals. People are going to get sick. People are, they need to be taken care of. But I think the best the measurement of our success will be is, one, have we effectively made the health of the community better? And by the way, I'm the, as an aside issue, I'm the co-chair or the chair elect of the New Jersey Hospital Association. We just recently changed our mission from being an advocacy organization to improving the lives of the people of New Jersey. Now you would say, why would hospital CEOs do that? Because the measurement is what you're looking for. If we don't improve the lives of the people in our community, then we haven't effectively done the job that we're supposed to do. Payers will change, payer rates will change. How they, that all comes together ultimately will form itself out, whether payers move all to risk-based or not. But most importantly, what will happen is I believe the greatest measurement of success is has our organization effectively impacted in a positive way the health of the community and the access of health care in the community where we serve. So to me, when I look at the model and the metric 10 years from now, they won't look on how many patients are in a bed. They'll look at how many patients are part of your community institution or tied into your institution that are being cared for by people in your network. So our target at Jefferson is a million lives you know, and to be part of our population health model, but it's going to exceed that. It's just going to have to exceed that because the populations, as they grow, we want more people involved. But I think that will be the ultimate measurement tool. What that specific metric is now, we're going to have to define. But when you become, you move from an environment where you're hospital-based to community-based, you then have to do a better job of communicating that to your constituents. You have to do a better job of communicating that to your board, saying to your board who represent the community, you know what, 
It's okay to have 15% less emergency department visits because these people are now being taken care of somewhere else. But you also have to be able to manage that payer bridge where you're in living in one world and you're moving to another. That's gonna be the greatest balance for us is how do we balance, even as physicians, how do we balance both of those worlds? But to me, it's all gonna be about a measurement of how you have done successfully to make your community healthier in general. And all those metrics in the community health needs assessment, if we could take those issues to substance abuse down from 68% to 40%, we've done a remarkable job on that. And that's what this all should be about. It shouldn't be about competing with Penn or competing with Cooper, or it should be about how do we, as healthcare institutions, impact the community? Because people are gonna choose different providers and they're gonna choose different things. But we hope that our model that we have in place will be extensive enough. I always brag about the fact what Jefferson has given us in New Jersey as part of them is everything from A to Z. From the minute you're born, as my grandson was born last Friday, to the minute you die, your entire life, you could be part of our, our health community. And it's about promoting health and wellness for you. And when you need opportunities because you're sick, we're part of that solution for you no matter where you go. So I hope that answered your question and uh, to give you an idea of how I evaluate it. And, and it, listen, when you merge, I always say this, I say this affectionately, every CEO should go through a merger. It's a painful process. It's a painful process because the process is painful when you're dealing with attorneys all the time. But honestly, it's, a, it's, a, it's an internal process where you realize you're making a sacrifice. You know, I, could, I, I have colleagues of mine, and Lisa Marinas here who works for me and actually helps me with all these presentations, my vice president of marketing. There's colleagues in my industry who will never merge until they retire. Their philosophy is, I'll never merge because I'm gonna hold on to this empire till the end. I could have did the same thing. But to me, that wouldn't have been the right thing for the community, because the right thing for community or for organization was, where do we need to be in 10 years, right? And you make sacrifices, because when you're the CEO, you're the king of the world in your world, okay? When you merge with an institution like this, you're no longer the king of the world, you're one of the princesses, prince, and once you're the prince, you have to figure it out how you negotiate the things you need, but most importantly, if you negotiate them for the best of your community, that's all people can look at. And to me, that's what I'll always keep doing. And to me, the best of the community is not just New Jersey. For me, the best of the community is Jefferson. I now represent the Jefferson organization. Decisions that are made for me in New Jersey are as equally important as the decisions that are made at Abington and South Philadelphia and Center City. There's no greater advocate for making sure we do the right things here at Jefferson and doing the right things in South Philadelphia for Methodists than me, because I think they're vitally important to the communities we serve. So that's how we have to look at it as an organization. And it takes some adjustment. People, not everybody looks at it that way. And maybe I'm an anomaly to that, but like I said, I always believe my competitors were my collaborators. And I have a guy who's in my market who's basically philosophy is, I wanna kill you guys. <laughs> you know, that's his philosophy in life. And I always affectionately laugh and say, well, okay, well, that's your strategy. My strategy's a little different. Please join me in thanking Thank the you great service me. leader, Joe Devine. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much.